Hi guys, this is Brady from Freedom Physical Therapy Services. Uh, I'm here with Nina Olson today to talk about urinary incontinence in honor of Women's Health Month, which, which is uh, goes through May. Um, so we're gonna get right into it. We're trying to raise awareness to the issue and that um, we kind of want to go through why physical therapy is a great option to help treat it um, and that we're trying to, to get the word out that physical therapy is a great option um, to, to treat it. <clears throat> so I want to ask Nina, who's our women health, women's health specialist, um, some things about uh, urinary incontinence um, that you may not know. Um, so we're going to get right into it. Um, so Nina, what, what is urinary incontinence exactly? Well, urinary incontinence is really just the involuntary leakage of urine so or feces. So basically when you don't want something to come out and it comes out, that's incontinence. It can happen when you're on the way to the bathroom, when you're just standing there, when you're exercising, um, and it can be urine or feces. Okay. Um, and is incontinence something that is expected to happen as you age? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not actually, it's really common. So um, a lot of times um, people, you know, as they're aging, talk to their friends and their friends are experiencing some symptoms that maybe when they cough or sneeze or laugh too hard, um, that they have some urinary leakage, but it's not, um, it's not a normal part of aging. So it's very common, it happens quite a bit, and it can be treated very easily, um, but it's not a normal part of aging. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what are the different types of incontinence? Mm -hmm. Well, there's many, um, but the two most um, common types are stress incontinence and urinary or urge urinary incontinence. Um, those are the two most common. So um, with stress incontinence, what that is is um, any intra-abdominal stress, so any increased pressure in your abdomen squeezes your bladder and your muscles of the pelvic floor are not strong enough to keep urine in. So that can happen with a big cough where you cough and your abdominals contract and that squeezes urine out. That can happen with exercise, a jump, um, lifting weights. So anything where you have your, your abdominal muscles contracting and that squishes urine out. Okay, so that's stress urinary incontinence. Okay. Um, urge urinary incontinence is urinary leakage um, that you have when you uh, have a really strong urge to urinate prior. So you could just be sitting there and all of a sudden a really strong urge happens and urine leaks out. Or you could be um, on the way to the bathroom, the urge is getting stronger and stronger and you can't keep the urine in. So um, urge urinary incontinence is um, classified by having that urge right before you have leakage. Um, and then the third type, which we see really commonly, is actually called mixed incontinence, and it's a combination of the two. So sometimes um, women are coming in and they have um, a little bit of stress incontinence with their exercise class, but then they also have some urgency that as soon as they pull into the garage and they're starting to um, take off their seatbelt, they're walking inside the door, and then, whoa, they get hit with a big urge and they have um, some leakage at that point. Um, so that would be mixed incontinence. Um, and those are the, the big, uh, most common ones. There also um, is one called overflow incontinence. And um, this is one that I see often with um, patients who were teachers or nurses that maybe couldn't use the bathroom um, as regularly as they'd like because of their schedule. And that's where the bladder over time has really gotten overfilled because they've had to hold it for long periods of time. They can't always go to the bathroom when they'd like. And when that bladder gets overstretched and overstretched and overstretched, it makes it so um, it doesn't fully empty, okay? So the bladder becomes overstretched and then when you urinate, it really doesn't empty. And overflow incontinence is classified by um, just a passive incontinence. You're just sitting there and all of a sudden some urine trickles out. It can be a little bit of leakage, it could be a lot of leakage. Okay. Not quite as common as the first um, two, stress and urge, but um, it does happen and it's classified by um, that urine that just comes out of nowhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you've explained that it's, it's not normal as you age right. and you've explained to us the, the different types. 
So um, for someone that's having problems with this, mm -hmm. um, what, what do they kind of expect coming in to see a PT about mm -hmm. it? And it can be a little bit, I think, uncomfortable, obviously, mm -hmm. to admit that you're having urinary problems. Right. Um, but kind of, can you explain that process of, of coming to a physical therapist yes. for that or a women's health specialist for that problem? Right, yeah. yes. So, um, yes, and you mentioned that it can be very uncomfortable to say that, oh, this really is a problem for me. But the overwhelming um, consensus I feel after somebody's gone through the therapy is people say all the time, I wish I would have done this sooner. I was living with this for 10 years and now it's gone or it's significantly improved. Um, so it can be very effective. Um, the first step is just talking about it. So you can talk to your physician about it. You can um, seek out physical therapy for this. Um, and that will um, kind of get you on the road to recovery. Um, what was the second piece of your question? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just want you to kind of explain when when someone comes into a physical therapist or women's health oh, specialist. Oh, what to expect? What, what, yes. what do you expect during okay. your treatment? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, what you'll expect is that we will do um, a vaginal exam. Okay? okay. So with that examination, um, we will determine what the strength of the muscles are. Um, and we can then figure out a plan for do we need to work on strengthening, um, how much strengthening should we be doing, what position should we start the strengthening in, do we need to have you laying flat to do your kegels, do we need to have you standing up to do your kegels, and it's a very individualized program based on the information we get from the exam. Okay. The other thing that we may do is we may give you a bladder diary. So there's a sheet of paper and um, it has all the different times of day listed and I'll give that to you and you can go home and tell me everything that you're drinking, how often you're drinking throughout the day and every time you're urinating and how much you're urinating. And when you come back in, I can take a look through that diary and see if there's anything maybe with your habits, um, your fluid type and frequency, if we need to change anything along those lines. So it'll be a lot of education um, uh, and some information will be um, um, gained by the internal examination. We'll also take a look at your spine. We'll see if um, there's anything off in your back or in your hips that could be kind of contributing to this issue that you're having. Um, so it'll be very individualized based on the patient's needs. Okay. Um, can, can you compare and contrast kind of, there's a, I was reading a lot of forums trying to prepare for this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people are using medication, like urinary medications mm -hmm. for this problem. Right. Um, are those kind of cover-ups to the fixes? Mm -hmm. Are those actually going to fix it also? Mm -hmm. Or how does that compare to, to kind of how well and how effective they were compared to physical therapy? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I've been doing this work since 2008 and back when I started this, um, I felt it was really common that patients would come in and they would tell me that they've been on these type of medications that you're referring to, typically the anticholinergics. Um, which are for overactive bladder. And people would tell me that they've been on these uh, medications for years and years. And now I'm not seeing that as often. So they are prescribed a little bit uh, more conservatively now. Okay. And I think a big reason for that is research that's going on in the way of the side effects. So the side effects are, are really strong for people. Um, they can um, lead to dry mouth, constipation, they even are affecting your mental function. Um, a lot of times patients say that they just feel that their mind isn't clear when they're on these medications. Um, so they are um, prescribed a little more conservatively. Um, also in the research, we have found that if we combine the medication for a short period of time with physical therapy, that that combination is very effective and even more effective than just prescribing the medication alone. So um, the medication that you're referring to um, most likely is the anticholinergics, and that would be for the overactive bladder okay. um, or the urge incontinence. Um, those terms can kind of be um, synonymous, overactive bladder and urge incontinence. There is not a medication out there for the stress incontinence. Okay. Um, that is purely we need to strengthen the tissues and change how that person is, is moving and maybe the activities they're doing. Um, so then, just in general, for people who are kind of iffy 
um, on the subject, what, what would you say to those people to, to keep their bladders healthy? If they have a healthy bladder already mm -hmm. and are worried that this might happen, mm -hmm. um, or maybe after they've gone through PT, what are you telling those people to maintain their progress? Right, that's a good question. Um, so we have this um, sheet here um, called Tips for the Healthy Bladder. And I can just kind of talk through this. Sure. Um, this would be great tips whether you are just trying to prevent um, symptoms from happening or maybe you have just some light symptoms that some little changes like this can be helpful. Okay. okay? So first off, um, just knowing what your normal bladder function should be can be really helpful. So um, normal bladder function is typically five to seven urinations per day. Okay. That's normal. You'll have your biggest urination in the morning and they'll get smaller um, as the day goes, uh, goes on. Um, the normal time between um, uh, voids or urinations is about two to five hours, okay? So if somebody is saying at home that, oh my gosh, I'm going to the bathroom every 45 minutes or so, then um, we need to you know, figure out, okay, is there a way that we can maybe try to um, extend that time out a little bit? Is it because of habit? Is it because you just first feel an urge to go or, and you feel like you should answer that call? Or can you try to extend it out you know, closer to that two hour mark? Um, nighttime voids, um, so getting up in the night to urinate. If you're under 65, zero to one times per night is normal. If you're over 65, one to two times per night. Okay, so if you're really high up there, then know that that is not normal at all. Um, so sometimes patients are coming in, waking up three, four times a night, and that's really affecting your restorative sleep. Um, so if that could be you, um, it's worth coming in for some treatment. So preventing abnormal bladder function. Um, we want to make sure that um, you're sitting on the toilet seat, okay? So a lot, and this is for females, <laughs> not you. Um, so um, sometimes um, patients, you know, they're really uncomfortable using um, different toilet seats. Um, so maybe if, you know, they're at work, they're always standing and urinating. Um, that does not promote healthy bladder function, okay? So for women, we want you to sit down on the seat and have a full urination. If you're hovering or squatting over the toilet seat, you're probably not getting a full empty of your bladder. And that could lead to urinary tract infections. Um, it can lead to incontinence as well, okay? Um, another thing that we want to avoid is just in case voiding. Um, so we call that GI, or JIC, jicking, okay? okay? <laughs> so um, what the problem with that is, is that if we're just using the bathroom just in case, so you, Wake up in the morning, use the bathroom, and an hour later, you're leaving um, to run out to the store. And you think, oh, I should just go to the bathroom. I don't wanna have to use it at Target, so I'll just use it here before I go, even though you maybe really don't have to go. If that is a habit that you're doing often, you're not really um, letting your bladder stretch. So if you're, if you're frequently urinating when maybe it's only half full, your bladder will have spasms to urinate when it's only half full. And that can be very inconvenient, okay? Yeah. So um, we wanna avoid that just in case voiding and, and keep that from being um, a habit. And that's a big one for people. Um, so times that it's just, that it's okay to have that, um, a just in case void um, is right before you have a high impact exercise, um, when you're moving your bowels, um, before a vaginal exam or after intercourse. Those are all fine times to do that because that should be not as often as you know a couple times per day. Okay. Um, we wanna make sure that we're spacing out our fluids um, well throughout the day and, and decreasing them um, in the evening hours. So usually about three hours before bedtime, we should really just be taking sips of water at that point. That's not when we should be trying to hydrate, okay? Otherwise, we'll probably be getting up more often at night. We want to avoid bladder irritants. Um, the lining of your bladder is um, very susceptible to acidity and um, caffeine, um, other diuretics, nicotine. Um, so if we are, if most of what we're taking in are classified under bladder irritants, then our bladders are going to be more spasmy. Okay, we're going to feel that urge to go all the time. It may even promote more leakage for us. So what are bladder irritants? They are caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, carbonation, and high acid foods and juices. 
Um, the least irritating things to drink would be water, of course, okay? Prunes, um, uh, plum juice, apple, cherry, um, grape juice, those would be better choices that are a little bit easier on the bladder. Um, and then the last thing that um, we should be doing is doing kegels, okay? So muscle, um, if we're not using it, we're losing it, okay? So if we're not exercising our pelvic floor, then those muscles are weakening over time. And especially as aging goes on, if we're not exercising those muscles, they're thinning out and we're not having as much strength and function there. So the gold standard is to do 20 kegels um, twice a day, okay? Um, so um, you can also do, um, if you feel like you're having some um, leakage with a cough or a sneeze, if you get really good at your kegels, you can do a kegel before you cough or sneeze, okay? So um, practicing your kegels regularly and then bringing them in at the time of need can be really helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, and then just one last topic we want to touch upon is that we've talked a lot about it's Women's Health Month, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this is still an issue that men do have. Right. So. Yeah. Um, I guess if you're watching this and you're a woman, you know, you can talk with your, your significant other yeah. um, or someone else that you know is affected and that physical therapy might be an option, correct? Right, it definitely is an option and we see men all the time. Um, so the, the um, kind of two things to keep in mind. So for men, a little more susceptible to that overactive bladder or the urge incontinence. Um, so at potentially related to the prostate. So if the prostate is overgrown, if, um, if there's some issues with the prostate, we could be having some urgency or some frequency. Um, also, um, we're really encouraging, um, if, if your loved one or you are, are having um, a prostate removal because of cancer, um, there's some really great research out there um, recommending that you come in for physical therapy for one to two sessions prior to that surgery. And um, the reason is, is that urinary incontinence is normal um, after, after you have a prostate removal because of cancer, um, because of the disruption of the tissues and the nerve, um, nerves down there. Um, it does improve and come back to normal, but it varies in how long it takes to improve. So if, and the research is showing that if we can get you in for physical therapy to teach you how best to take care of your pelvic floor, that you have a shorter duration of urinary incontinence after the surgery, which is really huge because that can um, really linger on and be very devastating um, for somebody who's, who just went through a big surgery for cancer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you uh, sitting down with me and talking yeah. about this with uh, our Facebook uh, friends and um, it's just been great to, to get this information out and that uh, physical therapy is a great option um, to help treat urinary incontinence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's Physical therapy is well researched and supported for treating urinary incontinence. It's generally very inexpensive and it's a great um, holistic option to get you back to normal. All right. Thank you guys.